Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Femi Taiwo and I am Chair of uh, Africana Studies. I am privileged to do the honors this afternoon to welcome you to this commemoration of one of the most important alumni from this university, one of the most important writers of our time, and one of the most important thinkers of our time, Tony Morrison. Um, <clears throat> I mention those in order of gravity, and it is why I mention the thinker last. Um, and I am glad that <clears throat> faculty of this department took the initiative to put together this celebration. And I must also point out that this celebration is just one, uh, a signal plan, but there are others that are coming from the college and the university, and our faculty too remain part of those plans. And I can't wait to see them come to fruition. Um, <clears throat> I look forward to this evening's proceedings and thank you for honoring us with your presence. Without further ado, I will call on the person who will handle this event, my colleague and chair of the programming committee, Professor Richard Richardson. Welcome. <coughs> Distributed today underscores 
by including an overview of all of her fiction as well as nonfiction publications, such as essays plus interviews, and can be used as a guide through her vast body of work in multiple genres. That in 1955, she graduated from Cornell with an MA in English links her literary legacy inextricably to this institution and challenges us to be good and bold stewards of it. It means so much, too, that we come together here at Cornell, her alma mater, to reflect on her life and legacy. She helped pave the way to this campus for so many of us. We are challenged to study and learn from her vast body of work. I have encountered Toni Morrison on my life's past several times and had my first exchange with her in 2004 on a panel that also included several students for a dialogue on her novel, Love, on stage at the Mandavi Center at the University of California, Davis, which is where I had my first job. That same evening, I was one of many people in the audience in that same building to which many people from all over Northern California had traveled to spend the evening just to see her and be in her presence. That perspective on her that I saw that night, wholly different from the one in the afternoon, led me to think, that is why God allows greatness. I have been blessed to fellowship with her several times more, including in this building, during a luncheon here in her honor in 2013. I teach Toni Morrison regularly, am teaching her now, and want to underscore how much we can learn from studying this gifted writer whose work has been embraced by everyone from Oprah Winfrey to Beyonce. The Toni Morrison Society is an organization dedicated to studying the work of Toni Morrison and is one with which I am now working to help plan the next conference. You can go to their website to find out more about their work, including the Bench by the Road project to map and memorialize sites related to slavery. Toni Morrison is famously reserved as far as having her life discussed in biography and preferred to keep the emphasis mainly on her work, which makes the recent documentary on her life and work, The Pieces I Am, all the more special. She was born Chloe Anthony Wofford in Lorain, Ohio on February 18, 1931, the second of four children. Lorraine is also the setting of her first novel, The Bluest Eye, whose 50th anniversary is coming up next year. She was the first African American to win the Pulitzer Prize in Literature in 1988 for Beloved. She earned her BA at Howard University in 1953 and again her MA at Cornell in 1955. She taught at Texas Southern and then joined the faculty at Howard from 1957 to 1964. She married the architect, Harold Morrison, and they had two sons, Ford and Slade, during this period. As a young mother, she began to work on what started as a short story and later became the bluest eye. In 1964, she moved to Syracuse to work as an editor in the textbook division at Random House Press. In 1968, she became a senior editor at Random House in New York City. As she was emerging as a writer, by 1970, she was helping many writers to come to voice, from Huey P. Newton to Angela Davis. The Nobel Prize in 1993 consolidated her position at the forefront of the literary establishment. It is astonishing to recollect that she was on this campus 10 years ago today in the wake of the publication of A Mercy as part of Africana and creative writing uh, commemorations and celebrations. Today is the official publication date of her newest book, Goodness and the Literary Imagination, which is a book of essays that draws on her delivery of Harvard's 95th Ingersoll Lecture. Her work continues to inspire honors, I mean others, and even now continues forward. The impact of Toni Morrison on me as a scholar and artist and as a person is profound, and she touched and moved me to the depths of my soul. I truly loved her. I want to end by discussing her impact on me as an artist. My art quilt, Nobel Laureate Toni Morrison, is part of my African American literature series, was completed in 2010, and was made in honor of her 80th birthday. It was mainly inspired by the Time magazine cover of her from 1998, 
but deconstructs it, for example, by mentioning Morris's beloved instead of Faulkner's Sound in the Fury, and signifying Morris's title to refer to her. The always replaces the word time, which is a term I borrowed that was spoken by Shadrach from Morrison's Sula as a way of describing Morrison's timelessness and enduring quality as a writer. The always of my 2008 Barack Obama quote, the first work completed for my 2015 show, Portraits Two, from Montgomery to Paris, of 60 quilts at the Rosa Parks Museum in Montgomery, Alabama to help kick off the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March and the 60th anniversary of the Montgomery bus boycott was also inspired by Toni Morrison, a point that I mentioned when I did a tribute to the author when she visited Cornell a decade ago. So this quilt of Morrison, like the art quilt featuring the first lady Michelle Obama, pulls together all of those significations and goes directly to their source. The quilt of the first lady is in the shape of a heart, a theme that the Morrison quilt also picks up. The quilt speaks to the timeless and enduring quality of Morrison's literature and points through Beloved to how much she herself is loved and respected by her global audiences. In the eyes of so many of us, she is royalty. In its spatial and body sculpting, the quilt also incorporates the architectural features typical of some of my newer quilts. The boa, last used in my debutante quilt series, also resurfaces on this quilt, which you can see a photo of in today's program. A print part of it will be released in the coming weeks to honor her. so important, I think, in terms of that narrative that she's trying to get across. 
And below that is the images of her other sons. So you have Slade Morrison and, and, and Ford Morrison. And it's ironic, when I'm looking into Toni Morrison's life, I, I learned how much parents impacted their children, you know? So it's, it's not lost to me that Slade Morrison was a writer, so to speak, with the children like his mother. And the, and the other son, Ford, was an architect like his father. <laughs> you know, so it's really ironic the things that you learn as you as you go away, go, come away with this. And so also what I've what I've done, like I said, I created all these different references to literary criticism. And I did this with academic classes in mind, especially with Professor Richardson's and other ones. So I have a link to some really important critique books I'm on it. On the left hand side are actually full text online. So when you click on those, you know, it should take you to for Cornell users of course the online version of these, of these important critiques of her work, you know, so making it very functional, you know, so making it try to make it easy for the user. And uh, on the other side of books that are in print but in the libraries but they're not online. My fun one was biographical, oh my gosh, you know, and here we hear Toni Morrison's voice in terms of who she is, a little clip from the, from the documentary of Pieces of I Am and also some key books. Now, the person who found it, I believe, Professor Richardson can correct me, the book here, uh, Toni Morrison Conversation by Carol uh, Dinan, she's the creator of the Toni Morrison, or she's in charge of the Toni Morrison Society, so it was important also to put that work up in there as far as that's concerned. The, the, the section, you always fall in love with sections that you do, and a couple of them tribute. Um, you know, in terms of after she passed, all these different tributes. One of the uh, things that we have here at Cornell is this database called History Makers, and I'm a part of them. They created this newsletter, and I got permission, and it's this beautiful essay talking about her and showing her relevancy with regard to contemporary society, and it's really worth reading. And some also some other tributes. But what I'm going to do today there's these noteworthy interviews, and there are hundreds, if not hundreds, but there's so many of them out there on the internet. And what I try to do is identify the ones that, that are really significant in the sense, of course, Angela Davis, you know. Uh, that's a no-brainer in terms of her interview, or uh, conversation they had at the New York Public Library. One of our alums from Cornell, okay, also in terms of the conversation she's having with him also at the public library. And it's an awesome interview. You know, it's like kind of raw in the face and they're like having a very good exchange with them. And one that uh, I'm gonna play in a little while is Toni Morrison talking about what motivated her, you see? But I wanna start off by showing um, an interview that she did with the late Ed Bradley. Everybody remember Ed Bradley? He was a 60 Minutes fan. Uh, he was a brother that I always remember Ed used to wear that little earring all the time. <laughs> you know? But he was a great interviewer. So what I want to do is briefly show uh, this little clip here. So I'm not going to talk anymore right now. I'm just going to play. Major white characters in your books. No. There are no major white characters in your books. No. The black narrative has always been understood to be a confrontation with some white people. I'm sure there are many of them. They are not terribly interesting to me. What is interesting to me is what is going on within the community. And within the community, there are no major white players. Once I thought, what is life like if they weren't there? Which is the way we lived it, the way I lived it. Tony Morrison was born Chloe Anthony Wofford in Moraine, Ohio, not far from Cleveland. It was the Depression. Her father was a ship welder, her mother a housewife. The neighborhood was mixed and sometimes hostile. People set our house on fire uh, to evict us when, we were, when I was about two years old. Set the house on fire? While we were in it. <laughs> Why? So we wouldn't be there, so we would leave. Chloe's father, George Wofford, had migrated to Ohio from the South. Experiences like the fire reinforced the deep feelings he already had about whites. He simply felt that he was better, superior, to all white people. His experience taught him that, that he 
was always in the company of inferior people and was surrounded by whites. You know, he didn't let white people in the house. <laughs> they came and he was not there. You know, insurance man and so on. Your father sounded like he had a tough core to him. Oh, very much so. He was um, an ordinary man, um, but an extraordinary man at the same time. He was very clear about what the dangers were and very clear about what he wanted for his children. Does your writing have a political point of view? Oh, no. The truth I happen to be most interested in has to do with the nature of oppression and how people survive it or don't. It's amazing to me, particularly for African Americans, just amazing that we're not all dead. That's a constant shocker. Paris is one of the few places where she has lived outside the United States, and she clearly likes it here, in part because the French seem more interested in her writing than her race. When you know somebody's race, when you know virtually nothing. You add to it all the stereotypical information and all the baggage that goes with race. But you don't know anything about that person just because you know race. So that's a um, really good insight that Ed Bradley gets into to give you a little background about her family and where she came from. I mean, this, the part about her father is very, very enlightening, I feel. The last thing I want to show is an inter interview she gave, and she's talking about what motivated her to write, and they focus around the first novel, The Bluest Eyes. So this is in the words of uh, Tony Morris. After I got into publishing, I took it more seriously. I had written little things before. Um, and I was very shy about it, although I liked it. When I was a teacher at Howard, I had joined a writer's group. And it was fun. It was social. They had great food. They were colleagues of mine. And at some point, they wouldn't let you just continue to bring your little high school essays or whatever. So I had to write something new. And I began a story that was later incorporated into the first novel I wrote. The Blue Eyes. The Blue Eyes. Yes. And I just left it there. But later on, when I was in Syracuse, getting ready to move to New York, I began to work that story a little bit more in the evenings. And I think it was not only because I sort of was interested in it, in the plot, I felt compelled at that time. This is 19, mid 60s most of what was being published by black men were very powerful, aggressive, revolutionary fiction or nonfiction. Um, and also they had a very positive, racially uplifting rhetoric to go with it. Some of which was, all of which was stimulating, but some of which I, as an older person, thought, wait a minute. One of which was, <laughs> you are my black queen. Black is beautiful. And I thought, yeah, but why so loud? Then I thought, wait a minute. They're going to skip over something. And no one's going to remember that it wasn't always beautiful, you know. No one's going to remember how hurtful a certain kind of internecine racism is. The things I talked to you about earlier about being at Howard and how people yes. were privileged because of these physical characteristics. That's right. Um, and some people felt very apologetic because their skin was very, very dark. See, I wasn't, we used to call each other names, obviously, when we were kids. But I didn't think it was like serious, that you could actually take it in. So when I wrote The Blue Side, it was about that. Before we all decide that we are all beautiful, 
and have always been beautiful. Let me speak for just a moment here. <laughs> for some of us who didn't get that right away. <laughs> so I was deeply concerned about the feelings of being ugly. There you go with the feelings again. That's right, just yes. how it feels. Yes. How it feels. That, so you've got the most vulnerable people in the world, which are children, female children, female black children who have never held center stage in anything. If they appear in a book, they're a, a joke or, you know, just some color, a local color, or a little Walmart. The least important. Now, black women have sometimes held center stage in some books by blacks, even sometimes by white. But then, you know, they were maids, cooks, housekeepers, you know, they were really running. But the children were always <coughs> lesser. So I wanted to have a little hurt black girl at the center of the story. And it was difficult because focusing on her only was just too depressing, you know, because yes. you lose some of the thrill of being young. There is some thrill to it, you know. Yes. So I surrounded her with people who were more like myself and my sister. So people would understand That's right. what it means That's right. to be treated That's that right. way. That's right. That's very, very good. Very powerful. That was a big motive in writing that book. Absolutely. And probably in many of your books. Oh yeah, here it, you know, it can continue to be an interesting, you know, thread. So we're at a point on our program where we will invite our speakers to come forward who will share reflections and readings on Toni Morrison.
dances, you will see the important people in quotation marks, but you see also little kids doing their part. So that's uh, literally <laughs> in that capacity that I'm here because the experts in the field are here. And as a social scientist, I would like to just uh, make a few comments without being in the way because you're going to hear the most interesting stuff, the commentaries and reading. Uh, I would like uh, to locate uh, Tony Morrison in our world. Um, both the black world and the African continent. And um, uh, I just went to those who have been honored in that, uh, at that level of the Nobel uh, Prize. What is striking is, uh, if you take the totality, the number on the continent and the black world, uh, you see one area where you see the majority, peace. Peace, interestingly, uh, when uh, Wangari Mathai, whose expertise in um, uh, veterinary medicine, it was peace, the most recent one last year, Dr. Denis, uh, um, what is uh, 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 it was an, uh, he's a medical doctor, it is in peace. Uh, the legendary Ralph Bunch, who did so much work in the United Nations. It was peace. So that's very, the one who came in the black uh, uh, world, uh, Lutuli, all of them in peace. So in analyzing where in the noble system black people have been recognized, this is one extraordinary and uh, problematic at the same time uh, uh, location of the majority of them. So when some of them won the prize, in the field where they have risen to uh, start up already, uh, it was something that called for a celebration. So that's the way Tony Morrison, uh, uh, being the world uh, Nobel uh, laureate in the literature, this is the way it was. She was the second uh, uh, African after uh, the Nigerian, one in Shoinka, but the first black woman on the continent and the diaspora, she was the first black to receive the Nobel uh, laureate. Um, so that in itself, when you are in the Pan-African world, uh, you cannot uh, 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 ignore it. It called for celebration, and it was at the same time an inspiration. Uh, as it was mentioned there when she was being interviewed, uh, by Ed Bradley uh, in Paris. Uh, the irony for some of us, those of us who were colonized by the French, with all the terrible things they did on the continent in our countries, but at the same time is when you travel away from your country in Africa, go to Europe, go to France, this is where you meet your people, the African Americans uh, who go there to also claim part of their humanity recognized, as she said, uh, her work was recognized there as the work of a literary giant uh, without any qualifying, although she was very proud to, uh, to say that uh, she was analyzing, commenting on the life experiences, communities of black people, but it's not black people as a footnote, it's black people at the center stage. And that's a one powerful statement that uh, uh, we connected uh, uh, to. Um, I would like to really make it very quick by uh, pointing to the second dimension of my comment, and if there is time, I will uh, uh, elaborate on them. Is uh, the um, kind of Alex Helles uh, style of roots, uh, Africa, Africa in her work. Um, some um, writers uh, have published actually on the topic of trying to find Africa in Mori, uh, Toni Morrison's work. Uh, I will uh, uh, cite two uh, books, one by Zauti Selassie uh, titled 
um, African spiritual tradition in the novels of Toni Morrison. And here she focuses on specific aspects, particularly religion, both in West Africa and Central Africa, uh, uh, specifically two groups, the Congo and the Yoruba, that she was, uh, did a great job of trying to find uh, where they come in all uh, 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 some of the novels. The second um, book that I would like to mention is a book by uh, Lavinia Jennings, and the title is uh, Toni Morrison and the Idea of Africa. A very, very fine job in which she shows the intricacies of West African religions, ethos, and the cultural practices, internal dynamics, societal contradictions uh, that are woven into Toni Morrison's work to give the powerful message that all who have read it have, uh, have enjoyed. Uh, a review of, uh, of uh, Jenny's uh, uh, work actually points out to what uh, she said, uh, the reviewer. Uh, Toni Morrison's fiction has been read, uh, um, uh, has been read by uh, Lavinia Jennings and it reveals fundamental role of uh, African tradition, uh, traditional religions and symbols uh, in her work. Uh, and it goes on to say how the symbols brought to the Americas uh, by the enslaved West Africans are used by Morrison in her landscape, interior space, and the bodies of her characters. And so uh, the, the, the reviewer uh, 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 ends by saying Jenny's analysis um, of these symbols show how the West African collective worldview forms uh, both Morrison's work and contemporary African-American life in, in culture. Well, uh, to uh, cite um, the African-American uh, uh, anthropologist Nyara Sudakasa, uh, you will not find a way in which the whole West African practice and tradition are lifted and brought here. Uh, in, in reality, as she argues, there is adaptation, as there is no direct tra uh, transfer. And on the African continent itself, things continue to evolve. Uh, that, uh, in addition, having to adapt, to adjust to the condition in which the enslaved African found themselves, uh, called for even newer creation of, uh, of uh, uh, realities in the daily life. Uh, but what is uh, very powerfully demonstrated still is what you find, the idea of a communal life, a family, uh, those, you cannot miss it. Uh, they are very much a reflection of African social um, uh, culture and uh, practices as they travel across history, despite uh, the adaptation and transformation on the continent itself and in the diaspora. I, I could say more things, but you see all these uh, powerful voices that are waiting. So I want to uh, keep mine uh, here. And uh, thank you very much for listening to my comment from here and there, trying to make sense of this extraordinary person. My personal feeling, just like uh, Professor Richardson, is the inspiration. Uh, when you find yourself in front of by some one of this uh, structure, the humility and the, the inspiration, and for me, the way she carries herself always is so powerful statement. Uh, you, it's not very clear one of the pictures there that you see uh, with uh, Professor uh, Turner, Professor Carol Boyd, Davis. I'm the one there, like a little child, trying to make a contribution or trying to come close to that extraordinary figure. So really, it's an honor. Um, uh, the Akam proverb says, a, an important person who passes, uh, the name of such person becomes a collective wealth. But her name became a collective wealth before she moved on to the ancestor, and she's still around us anyway. 
Thank you very much. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here in this capacity. I would like to maybe touch on two angles um, in engaging Tony Morrison. But before I say that, I should say that I met her first actually here at Cornell. Um, she was a white professor, I believe, maybe 1988. My colleague Roger gave me to say yes or no with that. She said, 88 or 90. I was a professor at SUNY Binghamton, and I came home with my two little children, who were like six and nine or something. And we were in the A.B. White House, and she was in the room talking to a lot of elders. And my kids wanted her to see something that drew on the wall. She got up from the elders and went to where the children were. And I was there like, oh my goodness, this is somebody really famous. How could you do that? But she said, no, these kids want me to see what they're drawing on the wall, on the, on the, um, on the blackboard. And that's what she did, and she went over there. The other thing I wanted to do is say that I was fortunate to one of the children's books was being launched at the UN, and Janice Mays invited me and Adams and Andrew Leontali to the launch. And, and he actually took a photograph of the four of us uh, together and actually called it the Black Divas, and I love that. And I'm like, okay, that's an official recognition for divas. I play with it. <laughs> so the third is Howard. And um, the fact that I went to Howard University for my master's is really significant. I did a master's in African studies at a time when Sterling Brown was there, John McKillens, Hakima Mabuji, and people showed up, Sierra James taught there, and so on. But I was really fascinated by the fact that, that Stokely Carmichael, in his autobiography, said that one of the finest looking teachers he ever had was Stoney Morrison. <laughs> and he talked about how gorgeous she was as a young woman, and clearly uh, my colleague, Professor Moomin, just talked about her beauty carry herself, but the fact that she was beautiful and also talented. So the fact that he described her as somebody who commanded the, the classroom, but also her personal presence was fascinating to me. So I was quite impressed when I saw Houston Baker's response to actually the Tony Morrison, Stokely Carmichael encounter, and I'll just read, I'm going to read a few little excerpts from his statement and another, another one. Our text was William Faulkner's The Bear to be taken up at the next class meeting. The following class session, I have nothing to say, having been completely mystified by Faulkner and his bear. Professor Morrison began to unfold for us an extraordinary explication of the Faulkner story. When all at once a hand shut up, just down in the front row from me, and a loud, mellifluous voice commanded, quote, Black people in the United States are being beaten and dying. The capitalist system is corrupt. Why are we reading this racist old white man who said he would defend Mississippi against any civil rights intervention with a shotgun in hand? Close quote. He continued, we should be reading Chairman Mao and Che Guevara. We should be learning the over dialectics of revolution. It was indeed the voice of Stokely Carmichael. His face was swollen, and he had a bandage over his right eye from participation in a civil rights action in neighboring Maryland just a few days before. He looked weary and incredulous that something as seemingly inane as a Faulkner story should occupy the mind of any black student. Without so much as a small readjustment of a professorial posture, Professor Marsden answered, Mr. Carmichael, scripture tells us there's a time and place for every occasion. For today, the time before us is reserved for Faulkner's masterpiece, The Bear. Please, let us continue in season with Faulkner's astonishing creative achievement. Silence fell, Professor Morrison's lucid and brilliant explication recommenced. So the conjunction of those two things I thought was fascinating, but also the role of Howard University in educating generations that included activist Sophie Carmichael, but also Professor Houston Baker. Two other excerpts I want to read, one from Edwidge Dantica. She says in her response to losing both Paul Marshall and Tony Morrison within a week of each other, and a piece titled The Ancestral Blessings of Tony Morrison and Paul Marshall, published in the New Yorker, quote, 
Miss Marsha wrote me a long and thoughtful condolence note after my uncle died in immigration custody in 2004. In 2007, Miss Morrison was at the National Book Award ceremony where my book about my uncle's death was a finalist. At the end of the night, as my family and I were leaving the hall, someone stopped me and told me that Miss Morrison wanted to speak to me. Miss Morrison then walked up to our group, which included my mother. We all chatted a bit about the evening. Then Miss Morrison leaned over and said, quote, I've never won one of these either. Only the one for all my books. She was referring to a 1996 National Book Foundation Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters. At the dinner, before a talk I gave for Economist Lecture Series at Princeton in 2008, a talk that eventually became my essay collection, Create Dangerously, as soon as we sat down to eat, she asked me if I had been well compensated. When I told her I was, she smiled that broad, generous smile, and then said, good, I don't want them being cheap in my name. And then from Dion Grant, a Caribbean writer who lives in Toronto, Miss Morrison imagined what was never imagined before, in her, before her in literature. Take the Monumental Beloved, one of a set of novels that imagined or wrote out the entirety of enslaved and formerly enslaved people. Their own narratives have omitted their full selves for reasons of political exigency. Her novel cycled through time, performing a kind of archaeological work on the psyche of the modern. Ms. Morrison insisted on specificity. She showed us clearly, simply, and powerfully how language binds on certain bodies and what it does. In her essay, Home, she writes, quote, the beginning the overweening, the defining event of the modern world is the mass movement of race populations beginning with the largest forced transfer of people in the history of the world, slavery. The consequences of which transfer have determined all the wars following it, as well as the current ones being waged on every continent. She had an enormous impact on language, on ideas, on breaking open historical silences. Ms. Morrison did for literature in English what Gabriel Garcia Marquez did for literature in Spanish. She changed the texture of English itself. Amazing. So what I've been doing is listening to all of Morrison novels on audible books as I drive around. So I fortunately had to go to New Jersey last week, so I listened to Paradise all the way. So I just want to close with a little excerpt from Paradise, from a piece that struck me when um, I heard it uh, on Audible last week. I started listening to jazz and finished that today as well, coming back from seeing my granddaughters. This is from Paradise. Richard felt bitterness take the place of the nausea that had driven him from his seat. 20, 30 years from now, he thought, all sorts of people will claim pivotal, controlling, defining positions in the rights movement. A few would be justified. Most would be frauds. What could not be gainsaid, but would remain invisible in the newspapers and the books he bought for his students were the ordinary folk. The janitor who turned off the switch so the police couldn't see. The grandmother who kept all the babies so the mothers could march. The backwoods woman with fresh towels in one hand and a shotgun in the other. The little children who carried batteries and flew to secret meetings. The ministers who kept whole church pulls of hunted protesters calm to help came. The old who gathered up the broken bodies of the young. The young who spread their arms wide to protect the old from batons they could not possibly survive. Parents who wiped the spit and tears from their children's faces and said, never mind, honey, never you mind. You are not and never will be a nigger, a coon, a jig, a jug, a bunny, or any other thing white folks teach their children to say. What you are is God's. Yes, 20, 30 years from now, those people will be dead and forgotten. Their small stories part of no grand record or even its footnotes. Although they were the ones who formed the spine on which the televised ones stood. Now, seven years after the murder of the man in whose stead he would happily have taken the sword he was hurting 
a flock which believed not only that it had created the past it grazed on, but that grass from any other meadow was toxic. In their view, Booker T solutions trump Du Bois's problems every time. No matter who they are, he thought, or how special they think they are, a community with no politics is doomed to pop like Georgia Fatwood. Was blind, but now I see. Do they? It was phrased as a question, but it sounded like a conclusion to fact. They are better than you think, she said. They are better than they think, he told her. Why are they satisfied with so little? This is their home, mine too. Home is not a little thing. I'm not saying it is, but can't you even imagine what it must feel like to have a true home? I don't mean heaven. I mean a real earthly home, not some fortress you bought and built up and have to keep everybody locked in or out. A real home, not some place you went and invaded and slaughtered people to get, not some place you claimed snatched because you got the guns, not some place you stole from people living there, but your own home, where, if you go back, past your great-grandparents, past theirs, and theirs, past the whole of Western history, past the beginning of organized knowledge, past pyramids and poison bows, on back to when rain was new, before plants could actually sing, and birds thought they were fish, back when God said, good, good, fair, right there, where you know your own people were born and lived and died. Imagine that path, that place. Who was God talking to if not to my people living in my home? You preaching well, man. No, I'm talking to you, Pat. I'm talking to you. Thank you. Students to do. 
but um, I had the good fortune of going to a program, um, and it was at the Macmillan Theater at Columbia with James Baldwin, Tony Morrison, and um, Oh, okay. yes. <laughs> I remember the name two minutes ago. Um, but it was one of those evenings that was absolutely captivating. And Toni Morrison stood out for me partly because of the sort of sense of peace around her. Um, you know, Baraka is Baraka. He sort of forms, he's a large personality. And yet, um, Morrison clearly enjoyed um, his performance, but she sort of picking up on what Andrea said just about her presence. It was at the same time powerful and quiet, and you had to listen and you had to think about all the things that she said. Um, the other thing that struck me about her was that. Um, she was able, like she did in Sula, to say these important and powerful statements through the lives of people who were not the folks at the front of the line, the people who, as she said, were the ones you weren't thinking about, the, the people so many of us overlooked. And through their lives, then she was able to turn turn your lives inside out in a way that made it significant for all of us. Um, I ended up doing my dissertation on um, women indigo dyers in Western Nigeria. And I got into the topic out of an interest in a tax revolt in this town, I mean, in the same town that Fela Kuti and um, Shalika is from. Um, Fellow's mother led this tax revolt, and I was interested in women in politics, and um, ended up coming to realize that these, this indigo dyeing industry was a significant industry in the town, and that in studying what had happened to them in the 1930s, it gave me sort of a barometer to talk about the, the tax revolt in the post-war period. Um, by the time I was converted that into the manuscript, I needed a catchy title. And Toni Morrison came back to me. And sort of the things that she was able to accomplish in the Blue West Eyes sort of informed then my decision on what to entitle that book. And that book became The Bluest Hands, um, you know, Women Indigo Dyers in Western Nigeria. Um, and there were interesting contrasts between the bluest eyes and the way I interpreted the bluest hands. Instead of, um, well, one level, when I would tell people I was working on indigo dyers and the makers of what's called adire, um, the indigo type dye cloth, many people were like, why? Um, and in many ways, um, indigo cloth. Um, was sort of the backdrop to a lot of people's lives. It's not what many scholars were focusing on. Um, and so in some ways, these women were like the little girl in the blue eyes, someone that wasn't necessarily seen as important. But one of the contrasts is that those dyers had a sense of their own worth, their own um, significance, um, this was an industry that in the um, 1920s was valued at about half a million pounds a year. Um, they understood the cultural importance of what they did to the fabric that they worked on. And so when indigo or using indigo for an extended period of time turned their hands blue, um, it wasn't something to hide. Having blue hands actually made you stand out in this community. It signaled that you were this craftsperson, that you were an artist in different ways. And so 
the bluest hands came to stand for important women, important people who over time valued themselves and what they were able to do. Um, one of the interesting things, I was in Nigeria for three months uh, this year, and there was a, a conference at Lady State University. It was a conference of the Lady Studies Association. And there was an artist um, who had a show up um, in one of the halls there. And they kept saying, you have to go see it. You have to go see the show. And so it was finally the last day of the conference, and I got over there to see it. And um, the first piece of the show um, sort of was about indigo dyeing, and it was a multimedia piece, and there were these hands. She had done um, sculptures of hands and put them on top of a, a piece of metal that had been fabricated to look like an indigo dye cloth. And um, in the descriptor, she acknowledged that the Lewis hands had been the innovation for um, this particular piece that she had done. And so, you know, in some way, Tony Morrison was the inspiration for the Lewis hands, and now it has become inspiration for um, other pieces of art. Um, the last thing that I want to say, as much as I just remember enjoying, or maybe not enjoying, but just being moved by the bluest hands, um, the bluest eyes, rather. Um, I think the book that had the greatest impact on me was actually the book. And I think so in part as a historian, um, as someone who you know, teaches or has taught about enslavement in Africa, but also in the Caribbean, um, who has students read primary sources, even they don't capture the, the traumatic nature of enslavement in the way that book does. The way it conveys the very difficult decisions that the loving parents made um, is unlike anything else. And so I think, as a historian, I value the work that that particular novel does for us. Um, enslavement, as it was practiced in the US and in the Caribbean, was an extremely violent and brutal institution. And some days, you know, the violence manifested in so many different ways, not only in terms of the actual physical abuse since it did sadism that was a part of it, but also in terms of the decisions you were sometimes forced to make. I leave it at that. which was only fitting, for it was in dreams that the two girls had first met, long before Edna Finch's mellow house opened, even before they marched through the chocolate halls of Garfield Primary School out onto the playground and stood facing each other through the ropes of the one vacant swing. Go on. No, you go. 
They had already made each other's acquaintance in the delirium of their new dreams. They were solitary little girls whose loneliness was so profound and intoxicated them and sent them stumbling into technicolor visions that always included a presence, a someone who, quite like the dreamer, shared the delight of the dream. When Nell, an only child, sat on the steps of her back porch surrounded by the high silence of her mother's incredibly orderly house, feeling the neatness pointing at her back, she studied the poplars and fell easily into a picture of herself lying on a flowered bed, tangled in her own hair, waiting for some fiery prince. He approached but never quite arrived, but always watching the dream along with her were some smiling, sympathetic eyes, someone as interested as she herself in the flow of her imagined hair, the thickness of the mattress of flowers, the walk, royal sleeves that closed below her elbows in gold threaded cuffs. Similarly, Sula, also an only child, but wedged into a household of throbbing disorder, constantly arrived with things, people, voices, and the slamming of doors, spent hours in the attic behind a roll of linoleum galloping through her own mind on a gray and white horse tasting sugar and smelling roses in full view of a someone who shared both the taste and the speed. So when they met, first in those chocolate halls and next through the ropes of the swing, they felt the ease and comfort of old friends. Because each had discovered years before that they were neither white nor male, and that all freedom and triumph was forbidden to them. They had set about creating something else to be. Their meeting was fortunate, for it let them use each other to grow on. Daughters of distant mothers and incomprehensible fathers. Sula's because he was dead, Nell's because he wasn't. They found in each other's eyes the intimacy they were looking for. Nell Wright and Sula Peace were both 12 in 1922, wishbone thin and easy-assed. Nell was the color of white sand paper, just dark enough to escape the blows of the pitch black true bloods and the contempt of old women who worried about such things as bad blood, blood mixtures and knew that the origins of a mule and a mulatto were one and the same. Had she been any lighter skin, she would have needed either her mother's protection on her way to school or a streak of mean to defend herself. Sula was a heavy brown with large, quiet eyes, one of which featured a birthmark that spread from the middle of the lid toward the eyebrow, shaped something like a stem rose. It gave her otherwise plain face a broken excitement and blue blade threat like the keloid scar of the razored man who sometimes played checkers with her grandmother. The birthmark was to grow darker as the years passed, but now it was the same shade as her gold flecked eyes, which, to the end, were as steady and clean as rain. Their friendship was as intense as it was sudden. They found relief in each other's personality. Although both were unshaped, formless things, Nell seemed stronger and more consistent than Sula, who could hardly be counted on to sustain any emotion for more than three minutes. Yet, there was one time when that was not true, when she held on to a mood for weeks. But even that was in defense of now. Thank you. Hi. So my name is Tally Gall, and I'm a new assistant professor here at Cornell in the Department of Africana Studies and the Joint Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies. And I wanted to first just thank Professor Richardson for inviting me to um, reflect on my time as a student of Toni Morrison. So I wrote a few remarks um, just reflecting on that experience in 2008. It was Toni Morrison's seminar in the fall of 2008 at Princeton University entitled The Foreigner's Home Literatures of Dispossession, where I learned about hard. I learned about horror as a genre, as a genre of history, a sequence of events written in blood that haunts the United States. I learned about the haunting of these unspeakable histories, unspoken, of violence on a global scale, and the forms that dehumanization and delegitimization of life take. Her death is an unspeakable loss for the world, especially during these dark times, because Tony Morrison possessed a special understanding of 
Her words and her teachings offered a compass for how to navigate the depths, the darkness and resilience of human nature. Toni Morrison had a deep understanding of what humans are capable of doing to each other, the intimacy and the violence. <clears throat> Professor Morrison, of course, commanded the room with an acerbic lift, straightforward sensibility, and a soothing and charismatic voice of a master storyteller. She had a grand and regal presence, and we were all happy to have somehow been selected to hold court in her seminar in the fall of 2008. Um, and it was a really wonderful time to be there, not only um, thinking about being in her presence, but in terms of the different guests or people who would try to sneak into our class. <laughs> kind of letting us know how lucky we were to have been selected um, to take this country criticism course with her. So among them were Cornell West, who um, bowed down at her feet, literally kissing the ground <laughs> as she walked on. Um, and it was a very uh, interesting time because of the election. Um, so class actually took place on election day. And um, yeah, Barack Obama had chosen Song of Solomon as that was very meaningful to her at the time. Um, other people who sort of stuck into the seminar we were Ed Shanti Pot and Misha Rashad, but I don't know her. Um, the peculiar story she told us each week in the three-hour three hour seminar um, helped me to begin to understand her preoccupation with boringness, which made sense considering the cumulative blood spilled from the genocide of American Indians, the enslavement of Africans, and that these were the haunted grounds that she inhabited and so it made sense that she told us she enjoyed the Showtime TV series Dexter, which aired from 2006 to 2013, the conceit of which was a blood splatter and less by day, killed in Miami, and was a serial killer by night who kills serial killers. It also made sense to me that she assigned us Ernest Hemingway's to have and have not which she, of course, had written about in her short masterpiece of literary criticism, Playing in the Dark, Whiteness in the Literary Imagination. And whether or not she knew the connections, <clears throat> when she assigned us extra credit to tell her how the Showtime series ended, um, the father of the main character in Dexter, so Dexter Morgan, um, his father was named Karen Morgan for the protagonist of To Have and Have Not, because the show's creator, John Lindsay, was married to a Hemingway, or is married. Professor Morrison's syllabus was as much about such odd connections and what she assigned us as it was the anecdotes that she left us with. So neither um, was what I think most people would imagine or expect. And when I mentioned that I took her class, people often asked me if she taught her own novels. Well, of course she didn't. <laughs> but we tackled questions of genocide, alienation, and dispossession more broadly. Each of the texts from course, in its own way, were about the essence of evil and who was considered monstrous in our societies. And I'm fortunate now as an educator to be able to continue to teach her prose as I construct my own syllabi with her as an instructor in mind. And in these words that we read and reread and that we're hearing this evening as we gather here, um, and in the words that I teach time and again, I can only think about how she is a compass navigating the American heart of that. Sets an agenda 
I was just at the talk this past week in where the presenter noted that the phrase legacy of slavery wasn't a thing on Google until 1988 when Beloved was published. Beloved literally caused a spike in the phrase legacy of slavery. Second thing, I come to Morrison and I always feel like I'm communing with my family, those who are with us still and those who have passed on. I read Morris and I see my Uncle Charlie, Budweiser and Paul Mall cigarettes sitting on the porch. And I see my grandma with her snuff spitting. Um, never mind if you're sitting below her. <laughs> Watch out. But I also see how my family manages grief. There are scenes in Morrison where you see people going through the depths of grief, but also finding space for laughter. Right? The scene in Song of Solomon where the men are discussing Emmett Till, at first there's anger, there's sorrow, there's rage, and then they turn their own experiences of these things into jokes. It becomes a contest. What's the worst thing white folks done to you? That's my family, that was my dorm room, that's me and my friends. And I teach Morrison, some of them in particular, probably as much as I teach anything else outside of Frederick Douglass's 45 narrative. Um, particularly to new students, first year students, but as much as I can. And when I do that, I feel as if I am sharing my family with them because Morrison wrote them. She, it's no shocker, she says she set out to write black folk. And she says this is what the novel does. Right? Um, and so I'm just going to read one of my favorite passages from Thomas Allen, which is one of my favorite novels. And it's a passage that features a woman, um, Lena. If there are some people you can see coming a mile away, like you can look at a person and say, this person will cut you. I will not mess with this person. <laughs> and then there are people like Lena and Song of Solomon that you just don't see coming. But Lena, kind of like my mom, carries a blade, metaphorically made. <laughs> um, and this is the scene where Lena is talking to her little brother um, milkman, um, making it the third. And we finally get to see that thing that Nina's been hiding behind the pain and behind cracking um, come out. Also, watch out for crackers. Um, the crack thing often helps them deal with things that would otherwise lead to violence. Just saying. Um, so, here's Nina. What do you know about somebody not being good enough for somebody else? And since when did you care whether Corinthians stood up or fell down? You've been laughing at us all your life. Corinthians, mama, me, using us, ordering us, and judging us. How would you keep your food? How would you keep your house? But now, all of a sudden, you have Corinthians' welfare at heart and break her up from a man you don't approve of. Who are you to approve or disapprove of anybody or anything? I was breathing air in the world 13 years before your lungs were even formed. Corinthians 12. You don't know a single thing about either one of us. We made roses. That's all you do. But now you know what's best for the very woman who wiped the dribble from your tin because you were too young to know how to spit. Our girlhood was spent like a foul nipple on you. One of my favorite lines. When you slept, we were quiet. When you were hungry, we cooked. When you wanted to play, we entertained you. And when you got grown enough to know the difference between a woman and a two-tone Ford, everything in this house stopped for you. You have yet to wash your own underwear, spread the bed, wipe the ring from your tub, or move a fleck of your own dirt from one place to another. And to this day, you have never asked one of us if we were tired or sad or wanted a cup of coffee. You've never picked up anything heavier than your own feet or solved a problem harder than fourth grade arithmetic. Where did you get the right to decide our lives? I'll tell you where. From that hog's gut that hangs down between your legs. Well, let me tell you something, baby brother. You will never need, you will need more than that. I don't know where you will get it or who will give it to you, but mark my words, you will need more than that. He has forbidden her to leave the house, made her quit her job, evicted the men, garnished his wages, and it is all because of you. You're exactly like him. Exactly. 
I didn't go to college because of him, because I was afraid of what he might do to mama. You think because you hit, you think because you hit him once that we all believe you were protecting her, taking her side. It's a lie. You were taking over, letting us know you had the right to tell her and all of us what to do. First he displayed us, then he splayed us. All our lives were like that. He would parade us like virgins in Babylon, then humiliate us like whores in Babylon. Now he has knocked the ice out of the Corinthians' hand again, and you are to blame. Magdalene Paulina was crying. You are to blame. You are a sad, pitiful, stupid, selfish, hateful man. I hope your little hog gut stands you in good stead and that you take good care of it because you don't have anything else. But I want to give you notice. She pulled her glasses out of her pocket and put them on. Her eyes doubled in size behind the lenses were very pale and cold. I don't make roses anymore. And you have pissed your last in this house. Now, get out of my room.
turns out to be that character. And I grew up with stories like that all of the time. And I thought about that area of the Hudson Valley of Esopus in particular being where Sojourner Truth was from and where Miss Tony lived as a young woman. I got an Airbnb across the street a little ways from her house with the intention of just going one day and knocking on her door. And I stayed there for the whole weekend trying to get up the courage to do it. And it was just like back and forth in my own mind, like privacy, don't do that, my right. But also, I'm here in this Airbnb, and if I can get up the courage for one second to do it, I'm going to go and knock on North Morris's door and talk to her. Um, and so I wanted to um, give you all that story and give you a little bit of context for um, what she meant to me. I was an undergraduate at Washington and Duke University. That's where I did my undergraduate BA um, uh, at the school where Robert E. Lee and all his dead kinfolk are buried. When I got there, I was, I was a small, hurt black girl. I met another small, hurt black girl. And uh, I was further hurt, as you can imagine, by that institution. I had come from a background of sexual assault and abuse and then got to that school and was raped my freshman year at that school and had to determine very quickly that I was going to live and survive. And the way in which I chose to do that caused my friend, the other hurt black girl who was there, to start calling me Sula. And so she called me Sula and I started calling her now. And we still kind of call each other that to this day living in this world in which now she is counsel for the governor of Virginia, so you can imagine the year that she has had. Um, so, um, so we were Sula and Nell and have continued all these years to be to each other. Um, I'm so very, very grateful for my graduate student and my stage as an audience right now. On the morning, on the morning that Ms. Tony died, she had the great empathy and presence of mind to think to herself, I do not want Larry to hear this from someone else, and she texted me to tell me that it had happened. And I realized in that moment, I was standing with a group of colleagues and realized that my response was going to be intense, as it had been actually when Amir Baraka died, I had the same kind of thing, where I knew I wasn't going to control it, so I just, not, just started to run to find a space to be by myself. And the tears like overtook me as I was running. And um, a colleague of mine, by way of what she thought was comfort, um, came and sat beside me. And she said to me, I didn't know you knew her. And there was no way in that moment for me to explain to this white colleague what Tony Morrison had meant to me and to my life coming from the background that I had come from and the knowledge that she had written that were literally a life and death thing for me. And so um, um, that I wanted to um, read the end of that novel, Sula, where that friendship and that way of being in the world um, was a thing that was a lifeline and a life uh, to me. And it's still, uh, I think, my all-time favorite ending of a novel. Shadrach and Nell moved in opposite directions, each thinking separate thoughts about the past. The distance between them increased as they both remembered gone things. Suddenly, Nell stopped. Her eye twitched and burned a little. Sula, she whispered, gazing at the tops of trees. Sula, leaves stirred. Mud shifted. There was the smell of overripe green things. A soft ball of fur broke and scattered like dandelion spores in the breeze. All that time, all that time, I thought I was missing you. And the loss pressed down on her chest and came up into her throat. We was girls together, she said as though explaining something. Oh, Lord, Sula, she cried. Girl, 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 girl. It was a fine cry, loud and long, but it had 
no bottom, and it had no top. Just circles and circles. Thank you so much for coming out. 